following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Our lecture today is called Sacrifice and Transformation. And in this lecture, we're going to continue some of the themes that we began to speak about in a prior lecture called The Machinery of the Soul. In that lecture, we elaborated and spoke at length about a series of events and a process that had to unfold starting at the beginning of the universe with the absolute having a, a goal in mind in order to know itself better, in order to gain its own self-knowledge. The absolute extends itself into existence or creates and we presently find ourselves in a, cer a certain um, set of circumstances, our, our current state of affairs, in terms of us having a physical body, and in terms of the way our present psyche or soul is organized, and the different parts of what we call our self, including our physical body, our personality, and our mind and heart, our astral and mental components, and our spirit. A lot of things have to occur in order for us to be in this current state that we are in. A lot of development. It doesn't come through an accident and it doesn't happen in a short period of time. It's an enormous effort that the solar logos undergoes in order to create all these different um, organizations or cosmos. So we are in a very special and fortunate situation because we have the capacity to know ourselves. We have a three-brained machine at our hands. We have a physical body that has three main nervous systems, and we talked about the three brains last time. And we have a psyche or a soul that has been evolved through the help of Mother Nature and through the solar intelligence that evolves what are called the protoplasmic bodies. Or we can just simplify that to say that our soul um, was evolved from its simple essence, its virginal spark, in order to gain the capacity to control more and more complex forms of energy. So even at the very beginning, having the essence or that virginal spark descend into the most basic type of matter, the mineral kingdom, and in that level, managing energy at that very basic level. And through a very intricate process that's guided, not through our own self-will, but through Mother Nature, the essence, that elemental essence evolves so that it can know how to handle more and more complex types of physical bodies. So we have um, 
types of beings or animals, we could say, that only have one brain. And they only operate on a in that one type of dimension, a very instinctual type of dimension. Then we have another type of being that has two brains, that has an emotional dimension to their existence. And not only do they see this world from their external shape or experience, they also have an internal world. They have an emotional world. Uh, so like an insect would be really only one-brained. But any type of animal that has that emotional component to it, you can see that there's another dimension to their existence. There's another dimension to their uh, life here, right? And it's more complicated. And we can see various levels of complexity in the animal kingdom and the way that different animals work together um, and they, they live and survive. But then we, as a soul, eventually graduate into the humanoid kingdom. And now we have three brains. We have an intellect as well. And <clears throat> this is where a lot of problems begin to develop. Because at this point, with the intellect, we have the ability to rationalize and to choose and to divert our will away from um, the type of instinct that we might have as an animal. So, there are a lot of things going on because our galaxy obviously exists in the universe and there's many galaxies and our solar system exists in the galaxy and there's many solar systems in that galaxy and our planet exists in our solar system and there's many other planets in that solar system and we exist on the planet. And inside of us, actually, are many living cells that we're a part of, that are part of us, and many other types of living organisms that sustain us. So in each layer or level, energy is being transformed, and it's providing, if there's harmony, a balance between sustaining itself and sustaining the higher order of energy. So even us, being here on this planet Earth, we're sustaining the life of our cells through our healthy choices. And likewise, those cells provide us with life. So we have the ability to make those choices, to, to be an agent of our own actions. But we, as human beings, or as humanoids, or as any living element on this Earth, is like a cell of the planet Earth. And each, just like each of our cells needs to function it needs to transform energy in different ways for our body to live. Us, as every body is like a cell for the earth. And every one of those cells needs to function correctly. And if they don't, the energy isn't gets transformed in the right way. And then the earth can't, can't accomplish its mission. It can't accomplish its own development. And also, it can't accomplish being a part of a larger development. So all these things build upon each other. And on one level, us as a living organism on this planet Earth, on a certain level, we have no more duty than to just transform energy for this planet Earth as a mechanical being. But of course, we have another duty to our own innermost, to our own inner being which is to know ourselves and to self-realize. So there is a juxtaposition here between two different organizations. It's as if there was cells inside of our own body that provide us with life, but they also had a capacity to liberate themselves from our body, to create their own independence. If one of our cells were to revolutionize itself and acquire its own life outside of our own body, we wouldn't actually have much of a problem with that because we have billions or millions of other cells, right? Most of them are not going to. In the same way that we, we're like cells on this planet Earth, and most of the cells on this planet Earth, most of us, are not going to find or be able to incarnate laws and conditions that will allow us to exist outside this mechanical 
instinctual life, but we do have the capacity. So the earth as a whole is providing a situation for us to simply transform energy for its own economy, for its own nature. But there is a possibility for us to escape that nature. That possibility can only happen when we have those three brains. Because that's when we have the ability to have those three forces, to work with those three forces within ourselves. That's really the summary of the last lecture that we had. And that's where it leaves us off. Well, we have this capacity to work on ourselves, but what does that mean? How do we do that? Everything that occurs in our creation, in this creation, in this universe, is an exchange of energies. Energy transforms from one type into another type, from one level into another level. So everything is a transformation of energies. Every movement is a transformation of energy. We know, even from a, a materialistic, scientific perspective, that energy can neither be created nor destroyed. It can only be transformed. And different systems of energy, in order to sustain one system of energy, you must take that from some other aspect, some other place, in order to sustain that energy. Because without something sustaining a system, the nature is for it to dissipate, for it to dissolve, or to fall into entropy. In this common world, any building that we're in, any piece of the world that we've changed, if we don't maintain it, it begins to fall apart. If we don't maintain the roads, potholes occur. If you went a couple of years without maintaining the roads, they'd all begin to turn to dirt. If we weren't here to maintain the buildings or our cars, they would fall apart. Because as we, we use them, they transform the energy, they, they take in all the elements of the weather and everything, and eventually they begin to fall apart. So we have to put energy into that in order to maintain it as it is. So even for this universe to exist, a s tremendous sacrifice has to occur. The, the Logos has to sacrifice itself to create and to maintain this existence. So we, that great sacrifice occurs related to the second Logos, to the Son, because that is the holy denial. So this world is created, and this world is then maintained through a continual sacrifice that Christic element is vibrating in every transformation of energy. Because that Christic element, that sacrifice that's ongoing, provides the basis for all of us to have our life, to have our experience. If Christ didn't sacrifice its own self into these lower worlds, it would, they wouldn't exist. They wouldn't be maintained. So this is, a, this is the law of sacrifice. This is the law of Christ, which is complete sacrifice. So because of that we have this ability to exist as we are and to work on ourselves and to do the great work. So since this lecture is called Sacrifice and Transformation, it'd be good to know what exactly these words mean. And the word sacrifice comes from Latin, and it means to make holy to make something holy. So a sacrifice means to make something holy. We often look at, in our common usage of the word sacrifice, we think it just means to maybe to offer a sacrifice to deny oneself or to kill something. But its, it's real root is to make something holy. And transformation, obviously, is to mutate or to change the form. Trans being, you know, change in form, changing in shape. So this is what life is. This is what existence is, a transformation of energy. And we, of course, include matter in that. Matter is a form of energy. You know, matter and energy transform into each other. And there's this other 
element, of course, you always say that consciousness is a part of it as well. So consciousness, energy, and form, or matter, are three aspects that are always exchanging and interchanging with each other. The absolute is this infinite, abstract, unknowable. And it, it projects itself into limitation. And by experiencing all the infinite forms of limited existence, it extracts that data from all those transformations. And if that information can be assimilated into the consciousness and returned, then the absolute knows itself a little bit better. So that's our holy duty to do that. Samuel Aun Veor writes that the intellectual animal mistakenly called a human being is a machine that is necessary for the economy of nature. The human machine automatically receives and transforms certain cosmic rays that are later unconsciously transmitted into the interior layers of the earth. This is what I was mentioning before. So there's many different levels and dimensions of how we are transforming energy. We know that we have this conscious perception of how we're interacting with others, how we're um, feeling different types of energy in life and how we're working with them. But there's many forms of energy that we are not perceiving. These, these types of energy are coming, they may be coming from the cosmos and from the superior dimensions and they come into us, but because we're not perceptive of it, they're really influencing us unconsciously. But we're transforming them. So these are types of cosmic rays that influence an entire society. Many revolutions that exist don't simply occur. I'm talking about revolutions and wars and, and um, overthrowing of governments or cultural type of revolutions exist not simply because of uh, a mechanical worldly events, but also related to cosmic influences which cause certain elements to start to erupt and bubble up into the surface. So the whole hippie movement was a relationship to cosmic influences. The you know, Bolshevik revolution was related to cosmic influences, these revolutionary types of things. And inside of that is both good and evil. And inside of that, we can see how one form transforms into something else. And through that process, there's always some type of sacrifice. So for the economy of nature, we would, could just be here and transform all the energy. And from that perspective, the earth would be just fine. Now, really us as, as our, in, in our humanoid form as we are now, we've really made a, a mess of things. But if we weren't here and it was just the animal kingdoms, you would see a, a, a harmony on this earth and it would be able to produce what it needed to. However, we've made such a mess of things. There's so much karma involved with us. We've made we've such a mistransformation of energies on this earth that the earth can't continue to do its... It can't... In, it can't um, endanger its future role. There are certain things this earth needs to accomplish. Future civilizations or societies that need to develop. But our actions and activities have produced something that has made it necessary for the earth to sacrifice this humanity in order to sustain itself. So the only way that we're going to avoid our soul from going along this current and being dragged down is to accomplish a revolution within ourselves. Either way, we're going to die physically, right? That shouldn't really be what we're afraid of. That, that should be something we know. But it's the, it's the trajectory of our psyche, of our consciousness that we should be concerned with. So we have to make a sacrifice of our ego, of our heart and mind, 
in order to sustain ourselves, in order to produce superior conditions that go beyond those conditions which are merely maintaining the economy of, the, of this earth. <clears throat> so when we talk about the transformation of energy, we, all, we usually refer to the three brains. And as I said before, that's the intellectual, the emotional, and the motor, instinctual, sexual brains. It's through these brains or nervous systems that we experience all of our life. We should know that although, for example, the intellectual center is related to our head and into our cranium, that all that it, it it's it as a nervous system is our is related to our whole body and to our whole spinal cord. We may know that our emotional center is related to the center of our body near our heart, but it's also related to the whole nervous system that runs through our whole body, that carries that energetic, emotional energy. And likewise, with the motor instinctual sexual centers. There are centers where that are, that are more intensely involved with all of these brains, but we should realize that the, all, all three of these brains are related to our whole body. All, all those nervous systems are interrelated. So we have these three brains, and now we have a capacity to work with them, to work with the energy. How does the energy, or what is the energy that we need to work with? There's many different types, right? And we talked about these cosmic influences. We can also talk about the influences related to our chakras and to the akasha and to the prana and everything. Those can be synthesized with these three types of foods. We say that there are three types of nourishment. The food that we eat, the air, and our impressions. So what does this mean? First of all, these nourishments are things that are coming from the outside and they're going into our body. Or, and even more so, they're going into our psyche, into our mind, into our emotions. And then that crossing between what we are presently, our state of affairs presently, and these nourishments or energies coming from the external, they go into our self, into our body, or in, into our psyche as well. There's a crossing that occurs. And if that crossing provokes a reaction or an influence for our actions. So, the most dense type of nourishment that we take is, our, is the food, the physical food, eating meals. Now, food goes through a process of transformation. Before that food even reaches your plate, something has to happen, some type of sacrifice, whether it's an animal or whether it's a vegetable or a plant. Even if it's a vegetable or a plant, that plant has to sacrifice. We have to sacrifice it because we are going to be eating it. And various levels of transformation occur with the food. We place it in our mouth and even immediately we begin to chew on it. And even that's a transformation. The saliva, that starts to transform it as well. And then the food goes down our throat and goes into our stomach and then more transformations occur. Different enzymes start working on it and different acidic type of uh, fluids in our stomach begin to break it down. And then it goes into our small intestine, into our large intestine, and our different elements, different organs down there add additional enzymes and digestive elements to take out and to break apart the, the food in order to get nourishment out of it, in order to get the vitamins out, in order to get the things, the nutrients. And those nutrients, through all this process, get broken down and broken apart. And those nutrients are really 
when it comes down to it, molecules. And there's, those molecules are orientated in certain ways that have chemical bonds so that when they, can, they are absorbed into our blood, and then in the blood they get carried around to different parts of the body, and eventually those molecules can be broken apart and there's chemical energy there. And that's what it really comes down to is that our body is a machine that's running on, from, from a purely physical point of view, it's running on this chemical energy. That whole process, more or less, takes place without any of our knowledge. We get to choose the food <laughs> that we put into our mouth. So we need, of course, the more cognizance that we have in choosing a good food, of course, that's going to help. The more cognizance we have when eating our food, that's going to help nourish our body more, observing it. Learning how to chew our food, to actually chew our food. That's going to help with that process. But beyond that, it goes into our body, and there's a mechanical intelligence there. This intelligence uh, breaks down all that food for us. And so long as we don't abuse the body, the body will, will be able to nourish itself. It's a very beautiful process. We, don't, we have very little influence over it. For the most part, that process is happening by, its, by itself. However, we, we can't live on food alone. There's other nourishments. And the next type of nourishment is the air, or we can say more specifically, oxygen. This is a more volatile type of energy. There's more, there, there's more energy in the air. And we can't survive as long without air. We can go many days without food, but we cannot go more than a few minutes without oxygen. Literally, our body will begin to die. So we know that the body needs air in order to live, but it's interesting, most people probably don't know why we need that oxygen, other than it, it makes us live. But there's specific reasons why. <clears throat> so we breathe in, and without needing any special cognizance, the air goes into our lungs, and breaks down into little tubes and goes into these, these little areas where blood passes through that has attached to those red blood cells um, the waste carbon dioxide. And those things detach from those little blood cells and go into our lungs. And that free space, the oxygen molecules, the O2, gets connected to those little blood cells. And those blood cells then go into the heart, and then the heart pumps them. To, all, to our whole body. And those little molecules of oxygen go into all of our cells, and that oxygen is necessary in order to run the machinery inside of our cells. It breaks apart the oxygen, gets chemical energy out of that, makes this stuff called ATP, and it runs our organic machine. And it needs that oxygen in order to metabolize the nutrients. So you get the nutrients through the food, but the food, can't, the food can't even actually run this organic machine that we have until the oxygen comes in. It needs that element. It's not complete. The, the, the nutrients can be absorbed by our blood, but it can't actually be used to run. It can't be used as a fuel until you add the oxygen. So the air provides a special additional shock, we can say. A shock of energy. This is what Gurdjieff calls a mechanical shock. So, in the system of the fourth way, Gurdjieff speaks about mechanical shocks and conscious shocks. We're not going to go into complete detail about that. But he says that there's a mechanical shock that occurs. That the food goes through this system, he calls the system of octaves. So it's going through these different um, transformations, as I was describing, through the mouth and through the stomach. And all of those ways, the food is becoming... Um, lighter in the number of laws that it's orientated to. But it reaches a point where it can't go any further. And it needs something else to further that process. And it needs the air or the oxygen in order to complete that process. So that's why we need air. Without the air, we can't, the food of our life can't actually run the, the human machine. Now, in terms of the air, 
Here, you know, with, with the food, we have a little bit of choice of how well, that is, how well our food is digested. We have the choice because we choose our food, because we can chew our food, and because we can be mindful of the way that we're eating. And that can influence our nutrients, right? But mostly, we don't have much influence over that. Air, or oxygen, the process of breathing, we know here we have distinctly two ways to breathe a mechanical way, and a way doing it consciously. If we don't pay attention to our breath, our body will breathe for us. But there's another set of nerves or electrical impulses. There's two sets of, of nerves that go to the lungs. One runs uh, the mechanical aspirating process of breathing, and there's another set that turn on and can override that if we choose to do it through our own will. That's very interesting, right? Because we know that the breath is so important and, and the breath of life is a very powerful symbolic um, mystery that we have the ability to breathe on our own. But we also, if we don't make that choice, our body will breathe for us. So when we pay attention to our breath, obviously there's more consciousness there. There's more power there to transform the energy out of that. So, with food, we could survive many days without. Air, we could survive a few minutes without. But there's a third type of nourishment, which is the impressions. And the impressions is something that we don't often think about unless you're in these types of studies. You don't consider that to be a food. But the reality is, we can't go a single instant without impressions. Impressions are... Um, tied to our very life, our very consciousness. It's unfortunate, but we know of certain circumstances of children that were denied any capacity to have impressions, that they were born in a very unfortunate situation where they were locked in a single room their whole life until later they were finally released. And unfortunately, these, these children just show how important impressions are. Because without the impressions, we can't, we can't develop. We would not be able to develop our three brains. Our personality would be uh, stunted and create a great damage to us. So we need impressions. We need to experience all these things. The impressions are vital to our existence. The impressions, just as air is more energetic than food, the impressions are much more energetic and the conscious intake and transformation of the impressions is the most powerful way to influence the energy that's flowing through our body and mind. We can choose, and we should, to choose good foods the best that we can. And that will be helpful. If we have a sick body, if we choose the wrong foods, we'll get a sick body. If we have a sick body, we can't perform the work very well. So we should try to choose good foods. But there are those who make, as uh, I think Samuel Unvior stated, a kitchen religion. They make a religion out of the food that they eat. Because when you begin to eat better, you feel better. But there are those who take it to an extreme where they believe that the more, by simply eating more and more pure foods, that they are relating that with a type of spiritual progress or being more spiritual. Of course, this doesn't make sense. Yes, eating purer foods will help your body and can even help your state of mind. We know that if we eat garbage, we get in a bad mood, or we have a headache, or we just we're not, we don't have the energy to concentrate well. So it makes sense to eat better food, but there's a limit to that, right? So unfortunately, people get identified with just that aspect of things, and they forget that these other types of impressions are much more powerful to work with. And this is fortunate because not everybody has the, the money or the resources to buy the best food. 
So we shouldn't be totally distraught if we don't have that capacity. We have to do our best. But we should realize that these other two types of nourishment are more powerful. Obviously, we, with the air, again, we don't have the capacity to always choose where we live or to get the best air. We do what we can. But learning how to breathe consciously, to observe our breath, is very powerful. But the third thing, the transformation of impressions, is the most critical thing here. Because with the food and with the air, there are systems involved that mechanically transform those things. But with the impressions, there's no organ inside of us, there's no organ in our nervous system that will automatically transform the impressions. So what does that even mean? Because when we talk about transforming the food or the air, we can see how that is a mechanical, how that process is, is sustaining our life. But with the impressions, what does, it, what does it even mean to transform the energy of the impressions? That's because the impressions are more related with our psyche, more related with our mind and our heart, with our ego or with our consciousness. So as, just as a recap on this slide, we see that food gets digested and there's absorption of nutrients. The air goes through you know, this process called cardiovascular respiration, enables the metabolization of nutrients, as I said. But this third here, what, tra what system transforms the energy of impressions? What has the capacity to even transform the impressions? The answer to that is our consciousness does. We have something that can transform the impressions. So we have this chart on this slide. The text is a little bit small, but there's a process of how the world arrives into our self, right? Things occur outside of ourself, and that information gets somehow travels from what is outside of ourself into ourself. So, physically, the world arrives to our senses through light and through sound and through other mechanical means of touch. All of those things are, are forms of energy that are going into our psyche. They go into our nervous system. So, for example, light. There's a light source somewhere, whether it's the sun or an electrical light. Those, that light can be understood as photons that travel out of that they bounce off of something like this table. And in order for me to see that table, that photon has to bounce off, from, go from a light source, bounce off the table, and go into my eye. And my eye has a certain type of cell that transforms it into an electrical impulse that goes into my brain, or into any of our brains. And from there, we have, we have a nervous system that works with something that common science doesn't know about, which is our internal bodies and our chakras. And our chakras are just centers of energy transformation. And there's a relationship there between our physical body, our vital body, and our astral and mental bodies and all our internal bodies. So we see there through that, that electrical transformation then goes into the molecular world as well, which is where our mind and heart are, where our astral and mental bodies are. So the impressions arrive into our physical body and into our internal bodies, and we perceive, we see. But there's different layers of filtering, right? So we can have good eyesight or bad eyesight, and that right there is a filter. We have good hearing or bad hearing. So the senses themselves provide a certain type of filter. But when it goes into our mind, into our ego, this is where the really big distortions and filters occur. When this crossing occurs between the external world and our state of mind, there's that opportunity. Two things can happen, essentially. That energy 
can process itself mechanically or can process itself consciously. If we do nothing, if we are totally receptive and asleep, then the process occurs mechanically. So whatever the nature of the impression is, plus whatever the nature of our mind is, with no additional elements, they'll cross and there'll be a result. Similar to like a formula. This plus this will equal that. So there'll be a mechanical reaction related to our memories, related to other unconscious elements, related to the reflexive grasping at a false understanding of ourself and other. All these things culminate into a reaction. And we can see how the world causes energy to erupt out of us. Even if we feel bored. The boredom is a type of reaction, actually. Because if we've ever had that experience of being liberated from our ego, the consciousness or that essence, boredom isn't a quality of that consciousness or essence. Boredom occurs inside of our ego. So even when we have boredom, that's a, that's, that's a response to the impressions. Because we have impressions that we're fascinated with, impressions that we run away from, and we have impressions that are either neutral or boring to us. And even those have to be transformed. So, the transformation of impressions is something it's very difficult to really outline because it's not an intellectual process. It's not a mechanical process. But we can say that we have to, through our own observation and comprehension, learn how to, learn how to observe how our mind is responding to the world. When, we living, when we're living inside of the mind, identified with its process, we are like a person inside of a car that's driving wherever it wants to, and we're just fascinated with that experience. We're inside the movie theater, absorbed in that projection. To transform that impression, the first thing we have to recognize is that we're sitting in the car of life, or that we're sitting in that theater looking at the projection. We have to have that realization. We have to have that to, to begin. If we're totally fascinated, then we're becoming one with it. There's, no, there's nothing different between the consciousness itself, the ca capability of perception, and all the elements that are reacting. Once, if we have that capability, then we can transform it. The reality is as well, that any impression that we have hits us in many different dimensions and levels. And we have to learn how to transform it on deeper and deeper levels. The easiest way to talk about the transformation of impressions is to talk about anger or lust, very visceral things that we can feel in our body. So if you have <clears throat> someone you have a a large history with a family member or someone like that, and they get, you get into an argument with them, it's very hard sometimes to transform those impressions. And we get angry. We may even know that I am getting angry right now because we've been observing this relationship. When it's very ingrained like that, the transformation, you have to do the best transformation you can. Be as cognizant and aware as you can. But if the energy is too difficult, which will often be if we're still working on ourselves, that's when you take that to meditation. You have to do a retrospection and take that deeper. Because one thing would be to respond in anger and screaming and slamming doors, right? That would be a lot of energy transformation. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be the transformation of impressions, but your anger would be going everywhere in every direction and causing a lot of problems. So observing oneself and not reacting like that, you may, not, you may go from that to reacting in a different way, but you still may be identified with it, still may be feeling hurt or disrespected. 
The ego loves to be respected. The ego can't stand disrespect. The ego has a set of rules that it wants other people to abide by. We want other people to abide by our particular way. And we don't want to be disrespected by that. How can I, how can I let myself be disrespected because you did X, Y, and Z to me? And we get locked in a type of reasoning like that. My, I am justified because they, they treated me terribly. That's the ego talking. But we get locked inside of that because we feel disrespected. So in, in one level, we may be transforming the most crude aspect of that and not screaming and slamming doors, but there's enormous amount of energy still there. Right? So mechanically, from the, the, the brain of action and, and, and physical movement, we may have transformed that aspect. But internally, emotionally, our heart rate may be up and down, and it signifies that those finer elements are not being transformed, and it's still sitting in our mind. And it's very, very, it's very, very easy to physically kind of transform our behaviors. That, that's a very easy level. If we become complacent at that level, we start to hide from ourselves emotionally and intellectually. We'll intellectualize something, and if we're not careful, we may feel like we're doing the right things because outwardly we seem to be changing our behaviors. And authentically, we could be. That's a, that's a transformation. That's a change. But we, have to, we always have to be cognizant, is it, really, is it really coming directly from a source of consciousness inside of myself that my behavior is being changed? Or am I trying to like hold down the beast and just behave differently. Struggling so hard to just hold down my, th this inner beast I have to not be totally identified in lust or anger or jealousy or pride. So there's different levels here, right? Because it's good. It's good to fight our own ego, but we have to comprehend it. We have to comprehend that experience. You know, there's sometimes we have dreams where we're fighting someone, whether it's a, some malignant entity or we're, we're fighting some bully that we had when we were in grade school or something else. Something that's, it's, it's a, a dream experience and we're in a struggle. Sometimes that struggle lasts the entire night no matter how hard you try to fight against this, whatever your battle is, nothing seen, you can't, you're just not strong enough. You just can't kill it. What that's representing is this struggle of opposites. You know, the, the stronger you fight against that, that bad element, the more energy you're locking yourself into that struggle. Because the reality is, that struggle is going to exist so long as the ego continu continues. It's all the ego has. It's that duality. The ego has to be sacrificed. It's the only way that transformation is going to occur. So in the dream, in the astral experience, that's death. If you're identified with the fear of, of being annihilated, then you're, you're afraid of your own psychological death. So to be cognizant, to wake up into that experience... Sometimes there's that experience of dying in your dream. You could die in your dream and you wake up in a different level of a dream or an astral experience. That means you're ready to die into that ego. You're ready. You're ready to give up. Not giving up as if like you're failing, but realizing the futility of that battle. So no, it doesn't... And you transcend this idea of being respected or disrespected. I think that, that idea of respect is very, a very powerful notion in today's world. Because we have this idea, as a Gnostic, we're supposed to transform the impressions, and I think some people get this idea that they're supposed to be a doormat to life, or they feel like they just need to take on all these bad people's character, tra uh, you know, character manifestations with gladness. You know, this, Samuel writes that. We have to learn how to receive the unpleasant manifestations of our neighbors with gladness and being pleasant. That's true, but we have to, there's a subtle difference between doing that with true gladness and serenity and doing it and feeling 
hurt and disrespected and, and then having a resentment, but we want to hide from that, so we pretend we're okay with it. And this kind of like intricate labyrinth occurs, right? That's a labyrinth of our own mind. So the, the way to get through that, of course, is through meditation, and it's through meditating on love and compassion. We, have to, we really have to go deeper than just the behavioral change. And if we have that feeling like I am being like a doormat to everybody because I have all these really terrible people in my life, we need, we need to listen to that song that we're singing to ourselves. That's a psychological song that we sing to ourselves. And we have to, we have to realize that we're telling ourselves, that we're like, it's just a justification. So we get entranced and we get, you know, we get into this fantasy of, of our situation. There's so many ways to become complacent. So the transformation of impressions happens on different levels, different layers of the mind. We can't perfectly transform the impressions until we're perfectly conscious. As long as the ego is there, there's going to be some layer that still is not being perfectly transformed. So we need to work diligently and with, with the right perspective that just because we have a, a negative reaction to someone, we have to do our best, but we have to know that there's layer after layer of that transformation. So this energy, the, the, these impressions are energy. So this energy, if we, don't imp if we don't transform the impression, what happens? What occurs is still a transformation of energy, but it's a mechanical transformation. That, that, that interaction or crossing of our mind and heart with the external world, or even the external world could even be the astral world when we're in the astral body, that crossing, it causes some reaction. We don't, if we then behave mechanically in response to that, we generate more ego or more karma. And we hold on to an element. In other words, the ego grows bigger when we don't transform the impressions. And the ego holds on to elements that really need to go to the earth, that really need to, to be given in order to sustain the earth. The transformation of impressions causes a liberation of energy. And that liberation of energy goes into two directions. One, to feed our consciousness. And another one, in order to give a certain type of element to the earth to, to sustain itself as well. Because the earth is not just a physical entity. The earth needs those other types of energies as well types of energy related to our psyche, related to the fifth and sixth dimension, to all the dimensions. So Samael Anveor writes, the law of the reciprocal nourishment of every existing thing exists in, this, in the world. The purpose of our lives is to supply maintenance to something big or small in the world. This law was known by ancient sages as the process of the cosmic common trago auto egocrat. Eskokin is the substance with which this great nature is nourished. So Mother Nature gives us life, yet she collects a very high price for it. She demands Eskokin in exchange, yet if we do not voluntarily give this Eskokin to her, then she snatches it by force by means of great wars. <clears throat> so this material, the Askokin, is an energetic, subtle type of substance. It's related very much with our blood and with our sexual energy. When we don't transform the impressions, that Askokin is not liberated. It's not fed into the earth. So our ego grows. Right? So if we do the transformation of impressions, we, in the same way that our physical body is breaking those chemical bonds in order to liberate, to liberate that chemical energy, it's almost as if when we are transforming the impressions, we are transforming energy into something more volatile, something that's more, more you know, 
For something to be more volatile means it's more explosive or it goes into the air faster. So when we're transforming the impressions, we nourish our own soul and we nourish the earth as well. So the earth needs that type of energy as well. So in the past, in a certain period, animal sacrifices were very popular. And this is because sacrificing an animal and liberating that blood, you liberate the Askokan in that sense from that animal. So that type of blood sacrifice provides that nourishment to the earth. And of course, this is very brutal. In today's world, this is black magic. We would never, we don't advise that at all. But from a certain type of mechanicity, it prevents Mother Nature from getting that Askokan in different ways because it needs to get it. So as the, those, those sacrifices of animals started to be phased out, what needed to be phased in was a transformation of impressions, was the sacrifice of our ego, which is another type of blood sacrifice, but it's our psychological sense. But we didn't do that. So because we're not liberating the energy related to the sacrifices of animals and we're not actually transforming our psyche, Mother Nature needed that as Kalkin to sustain itself. And that is one, another one of those influences that cause these great wars, the First and Second World Wars, for example. So Mother Nature needs the as Kalkin one way or another. The transformation of impressions is the answer. Because if we don't give the Askokan to the Mother Nature, she will get it in some other way. This earth exists and it needs to produce seven humanities. So it needs two more. We're in the fifth humanity right now, so there's two more to come. And Regardless of whether we behaved all correctly or not, those two future humanities need to occur. But our actions unchecked, our actions the way they are right now, would destroy this earth and prevent it from developing those future humanities. So from that respect, this earth needs to manage us and to provide great wars and cataclysms that will occur because we are like a cancer to this earth. We are, we are killing it. We are taking all the energy, feeding very fat egos. And in the end, it doesn't help us and it doesn't help anything. So the Askokan will be returned and exchanged. And the earth needs the Askokan. And, and in another sense, the earth needs to give energy to the higher systems. Just as the earth gets this energy from the solar logos, transforms the energy, and it returns it. It happens on all the different layers of the cosmos. We need to play our part in that. We need to do our cosmic duty, our sacred duty, which is to sacrifice, at this point, is to sacrifice our own ego. And through the transformation of impressions, through the sacrifice of our ego, we liberate higher forms of energy. And only when we liberate those higher forms of energy do we have the reserves to be awake and to maintain wakefulness in more tempting or subtle dimensions. We want to be aware in the astral and mental worlds. We have to not just conserve our energy. We say we have to conserve our energy, but we also have to know how to transform our energy. It's not enough to simply, you know, sit uh you know, if we were just to sit in our room all day and not do anything, that would we'd be conserving a lot of energy, I think. But we're not transforming anything. We're not able to, because we're not getting any types of impressions that are difficult to transform. When you transform it, you don't just you're not just the same as you were. You're transforming that into something that's more volatile, something that's more energetic, and that feeds your consciousness. That feeds the higher centers. You're a, they're able to operate. And there are superior centers, superior emotional and superior intellectual centers that can only operate 
through a finer type of energy. And that finer type of energy can only occur when we're behaving in the right way. And that goes along with not only the transformation of impressions, but the transmutation of sexual energy as well, which is linked, of course. So we can always relate all this work with the three factors, and we know that the three factors from other lectures is death, birth, and sacrifice for humanity. And inside these three factors is this transformation and sacrifice, because death and birth, of course, is a transformation. To die is a matter of revolutionary ethics and dissolution of the psychological ego. To be born is a subject related to sexual transmutation. Sacrifice for humanity is universal and cognizant charity. So this is our duty to our own inner being, is to accomplish a continual transformation of energies. The being that can totally transform all forms and dimensions of energy perfectly is transparent to this world. They, in other words, they enter into the absolute because they are a perfect transform, transformer of all energy. They cannot see any shadow or distortion of their existence. So when you transform, when you, uh, for example, you're presented with a difficult person in front of you, if you have perfect serenity in, in front of that difficult person, you've, perfectly you've more or less perfectly transformed that impression. There's no residue of it in your mind. It's completely transparent. A great being that enters into the absolute is transparent in all dimensions, in all ways. It perfectly can transform everything. And if you perfectly transform everything, there's no distortion, there's no shadow, there's no, you can't see it from any angle. It's perfect. And that type of being, there's nothing left to accomplish here, so it enters into the absolute. But we have to work where we're at. I think we will end there. Do we have any questions? In the back. What are dreams? Um, do we transform impressions in, like, after we dream? You know, how, does that, how, how does dreams come into effect? Dreams are also impressions. Mm -hmm. So even in our astral body, we have the three brains. Our understanding of the three brains needs to be synthesized and really comprehended because we see it as a physical thing. But all of our bodies have those brains as well. So even in the astral plane, we're in the astral body. We have intellectual, emotional, and motor instinctive sexual brain, right? Because in the astral world, you could see something lustful and your sexual brain is being activated, or you see something emotional. The impressions of the astral world are different. They're more subtle. They're more powerful. They cause a greater reaction in our mind. It's more difficult to transform the impressions in, in the astral world because it's more subtle. So to have, to maintain cognizance means we need more stability than if we were, to maintain cognizance here in the physical world, a basic minimum is one thing, but to do it in the astral world, you have to even have more stability. You may, main, you may awaken and then fall asleep because you get fascinated and you didn't transform it. There's a lot of things that are different, obviously, with the astral world because it's an internal world. So when your state of mind suddenly changes and becomes identified with it, you're, you're, it appears as if your external world is changing when your mind is operating differently. Here in the external world, our internal world changes, but relatively speaking, the external world stays the same. But in the inner worlds, in the astral plane, we could be observing objective space, or we could be observing the subjective space, the infernal worlds. So the astral plane is more complicated, it's more subtle. It's more powerful. Any other questions? So you mentioned that um, certain intense impressions that you would in order to release that more subtle, powerful energy. Yeah. 
So do you think that's probably why somebody else spoke against it in the moment? So the question is, you know, the monk or yogi in a cave who's meditating their whole life or kind of cloistered away in a temple versus us and kind of engaged in this modern world. In this period, in this time, for he, especially we know that we've been born in this place, the more intense impressions that we have, the more of a capacity there is to transform them and to be elevated by them. There is a capacity to, for example, go into a, a cave or into a retreat and access states of consciousness that allow you to transform your mind. But that's probably not what we need. There are certain individuals that accomplished great feats while in solitude. But basically what happens with these powerful impressions is there's an opportunity that's afforded to us. And we should, uh, we should, take, that, we should take that opportunity. If we're confronted with our anger, now our anger is right there. We didn't have to meditate to access it. It's right there. And now we can see it. You know, it's like the alligator coming out of the waters. If we're an expert diver, we could go into the waters and see things in the depth. But if we have a life that's showing us all the beasts in the water, we don't have to go very far. It comes up to us, and we just have to deal with it. So, <clears throat> are all those intense impressions necessary? Well, that's a very complex question because all of our karma is different. It may be necessary for us. We can't avoid our karma, right? Well, you said we're, we're with us. So in terms of giving and receiving, right? So we have blockage, meaning we don't transform the impression properly, right? So we can't give back. So it's like a machine of giving, receiving and giving, right? So with that receiving and giving, yeah. Right. So, like, we can we can um, symbolize our ego like a knot of energy. So instead of us perfectly transforming, giving and receiving, the ego takes it for itself. And when the ego builds itself, it sacrifices someone else or sacrifices something else. There's the only way to sustain one system is to sacrifice the other system. And we sacrifice people all the time. Not physically, but emotionally. We hurt other people. We make their blood vessels fill up. We get their face turns red, right? That's a blood sacrifice. We sacrifice your ego and you make them embarrassed. You make them angry. Their, all their blood flows up. Their heart rate pumps that's like it's almost like a blood sacrifice, you can think of that. And it's our ego doing it, satisfying itself. So this reciprocal nourishment is, we need to learn how to, to handle that with serenity and with cognizance. And we need to, when we say that we need to receive the unpleasant manifestation of our fellow men with gladness, it's knowing that if someone else presents me to me with these impressions that are difficult, the difficulty isn't that other person. The difficulty is my mind accepting it. My, the difficulty or the resistance exists inside of, my, inside of my ego. It's not out there. That person is just as they are. They might have their own ego and their own problems, but the resistance is in my own self. And that resistance is blocking that perfect transformation. It's easier said than done. And that's where the intellect comes in and can kind of hide from, from itself and pretend that it's serene when it's really not serene. Well, that's what returns the ego, right? Which returns? The ego returns, not the personality. Oh, you mean life after life? Right, so the ego... 
The ego gets attached to this mechanical wheel of evolution and devolution. It keeps returning. But when we annihilate the ego completely, we give back everything that the, the earth needs, and we are then able to operate under different laws. We're not subject to those laws. We don't have any... The ego is like these chains that attach us to this mechanical rotating wheel. We, we, even though we physically die, psychologically we're still attached. And it's not until we remove all of those attachments that we can exist outside of this little sphere of the earth to be able to operate in the other worlds. We have to liberate ourselves from these laws. And those laws related to our ego. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Amen.